I'm speaking. I have no I'm way speaking. Yet. Everybody's been through that, right? It's like, do not interrupt me. Respect me. I've had to abruptly say, I'm talking. If you're black, if you're a woman, of course you've had these issues. They happen all the time. We're often not heard. We have all continued to suffer from that. You're so used to being marginalized. We are so used to being underestimated. We are so used to being pushed in the background, and yet we get it done anyway. For me, the craziest story was just not being afraid and trying to make myself afraid. I'm speaking. I I'm speaking. In. Hello, and welcome to I'm Speaking. I'm Lori Stokes. When now Vice President Kamala Harris uttered those words at last year's debate, she said what every woman has wanted to say many times. Though for black women, it's magnified. Our special, I'm speaking, delves into the lives of six powerful black women at the top of their professions with many firsts on their resumes. One of a handful of the nation's black female CEOs and first to chair a Fortune 500 board. The first black woman in space won a few black female advisors in the White House. New York's first black woman attorney general and New York's first black and female state Senate president and New Jersey's first black woman lieutenant governor. And yet, as former first lady Michelle Obama put it, all of these women have often felt invisible. That's changing from the courtroom to the boardroom to the situation room. We found this in the White House. President Obama had to kind of tell the guys, wait a minute now, I want you to listen to these extraordinarily talented women who I have assembled. They're here for a reason. I expect you to listen to their voices and take your voices down a notch. And then he said to the women, and I want you guys to speak up. Talent and genius do not discriminate. You want the best in the room. Jesse Jackson uses that line where he says baseball wasn't as good as it could be until Jackie Robinson can play. I don't believe that any halls of society, corporate America, government, etc., are as good as they can be until everyone has a shot to be in the room. I've had a number of those moments, <laughs> but you know, I don't dwell on those. Each of these women, as little girls, had the audacity to dream big, but they were reminded as a black woman to reach that goal there's a different standard. I think it's how we were raised. I think it absolutely is a black woman thing where my parents always said, you better be twice as prepared, twice as good. And Valerie Jarrett was twice as good, leading in Chicago City Hall and then as senior advisor to President Barack Obama, ushering through groundbreaking legislation like the Affordable Care Act. Many people told him that the political price was too high. And he said, well, what's the point in running for office and winning unless you're going to actually deliver something important. May Jemison reached for the stars, the first black woman to travel to space. Take me back to 1992. So people always ask, you know, what was it like to be in space? And they first of all want to find out, or were you afraid? Well, for me, it wasn't one about fear. It was a good, healthy respect for the engines. But I actually tried to make myself afraid in, while I was in space on orbit, but I couldn't because I recognized that I was as much a part of this universe as any speck of stardust. Some of the other women we spoke to were also the first. I will faithfully discharge the duties of. Of the Office of Attorney General. The Office of Attorney General. New York's first black and female attorney general, Letitia James. That fact is nothing more than a historical footnote. And it will be nothing more than historical footnote. The question really is, is as the first, you need to make sure that you're not the last. New York's first black and female state Senate president, Andrea Stewart Cousins. My journey was unchartered and, and unexpected. But because I was in a position where at least I wasn't afraid of challenges, I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, and here I am. New Jersey's first black woman to serve as lieutenant governor, Sheila Oliver. As a female lieutenant governor, still have to be overly assertive, uh, pushy, and aggressive. Melody Hobson took on the business world, the first black woman to serve as the chair of a Fortune 500 board, now at the helm of Starbucks, and one of an exclusive club as co-CEO of an investment firm. My life is a miracle. 
but a lot of stars had to align for all of this to be possible. Growing up in Chicago, the youngest of six kids, a mo single mother. Someone would say with that beginning of a background, how could you possibly have a road paved to where you are today? I actually think it's because of that background that this all has happened in this way. So where, where did Letitia James get this dream to go into law? My mom, one day when I was around 13, 14, my brother was falsely accused of a crime. She brought me down to criminal court with her. And I can recall um, where everyone in the courtroom in the audience looked like me and all of the defendants looked like me, but everyone else, the judge, the court officers, everyone did not look like me. And I can recall a court officer basically telling individuals to be quiet and to shut up. And I vowed at that moment that um, I wanted to be um, either a prosecutor or a defense attorney so that no mother or father or grandmother or grandfather would ever be disrespected. Despite growing up in the south side of Chicago, Mae Jemison never doubted she would travel to space. It was really um, something that I assumed I would do since I was a little girl. I thought I'd go there to work in space. At that time, there were no women in the United States astronaut program. There were no people of color in the astronaut program, but I thought that that was a failing in terms of, of the <laughs> astronaut program. Not that it had anything to do with me or our capabilities. So who was your role model? Barbara Jordan. She was on the Judiciary Committee during the impeachment hearings of Richard Nixon. And she basically said that no one is above the law. It was definitely the late Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm going to Congress as the first black woman. She is the congressperson responsible for seeing for the first time federal appropriation for childcare and daycare. And uh, you know, she famously told us, if you don't have a seat at the table, then bring a folding chair. All roads lead to Barbara Bowman, my mother, who's 92 and still works full time. She was a working mom, Lori, at a time when many moms didn't work. And so in a sense, she stood out. And she showed me that you could be both a uh, professional, uh, accomplished uh, woman and a mom. My role models have also been, and this is going to sound very strange, people that I don't want to be anything like. And I look at them and I say, that is a foil. That is the opposite of what I want to be. Coming up on I'm Speaking. The micro and macro aggressions show up day in and day out. Despite reaching the pinnacle of their careers, these amazing women tell us about the times they were looked down on and how they overcame that. The black women who are often too often overlooked, but so often prove they are the backbone of our democracy. Welcome back to I'm Speaking. They've reached the highest levels in their career paths, but all the women we spoke with at one time or another have been reminded that no matter what they achieve, when they walk into a room, they're seen as a black woman. And that comes with its own biases. Condoleezza Rice talked about how she was at a jewelry store and she wanted to see some jewelry and the woman on the other side of the counter had said to her, oh no, you want to look at the costume jewelry. And Condoleezza told her, uh, let's get something straight. You are on that side of the counter and I'm on this side of the counter. So on a Absolutely. personal level, have you had that type of experience? Going to a meeting in an office building, I stepped onto the elevator and the woman that was on the elevator began to clutch her purse. And I turned to her and I said, uh, ma'am, I don't want your pocketbook. I have one of my own. And that sometimes never goes away. My uh, license plate on the car is Senate one. And so I, but I sometimes drive myself and I, I was driving into this place. And so the guard uh, looked at the license plate, looked at me and said, you, you're here to pick up. It's interesting to see that the male driver Mm -hmm. will be assumed to be the senator. Uh, and if I'm driving, I'm assumed not to be the senator. They're called microaggressions, but I don't think the word micro does the impact justice because they do add up. I'm thinking of your dear friend, 
our former first lady, Michelle Obama. She talked about black women being invisible. Maybe this is the beginning of that not being true. When I'm mentoring young women, I have said, you know, it is personal, but don't take it personally and let it quiet your voice. There was a member of the Starbucks board named Olden Lee, who was amazing, been waiting for a plane one day, leaving Seattle. And I was talking to him about some issue related to, you know, being slighted. And he looked at me and he said, Melody, how long have you been black? How long have you been a woman? And I literally, to this day, I was crying laughing because you can't, you know, if you're black, if you're a woman, of course you've had these issues. The micro and macro aggressions show up day in and day out. Now, I'm not daunted by it. I'm not bowed by it. You know, oftentimes we as women of color are invisible, but my message is to little girls out there, be they black or white, Latino or Asian, um, that you should, you know, reach for the sky and that no one should define you. You've always uh, said you are quintessentially a black woman. I give the story of, I was at John Johnson's funeral, the very famous, famous entrepreneur who started Ebony and Jet magazines. And Tom Joyner said he was unapologetically black in his eulogy. And it just like took my breath away. And I had never thought of that concept. And I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be unapologetically black and I want to be unapologetically a woman. I don't want to walk into rooms apologizing for who I am. Neither did Vice President Harris. A long journey in American history. The nation now has its first female vice president who is black and South Asian. I Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution. For these women, a pride that's palpable because they didn't think it was probable, but it proved to be. Did you ever think we'd have a black vice president? No. Female I, at that? No, I did not. But I will tell you something. After this summer of a united front of Black Lives Matters and, you know, people joining hands, whoever the presidential candidate was, if that presidential candidate did not select a black woman as his vice president, he or she would not have been elected. It was hard for me to even indulge the fantasy of her winning because I didn't want to be disappointed. And it's funny, I now remind myself of my parents who felt that way when Barack Obama was running. They kept saying, there's no way he can win. There's no way he can win. And really they just didn't want to be disappointed. And I think I felt somewhat the same way. So when she won, I, I cried. I mean, it's beyond, you know, it's, it's really, it's motivating and, you know, role model, yes, Kamala, um, reminds me that anything is possible. They talk about glass ceilings for black women. It's, it's a concrete ceiling. And for her to have been elected as the next vice president, again, sends a message to everyone, everyone, and certainly girls of all colors, that the top is within reach. She's not shy about saying, yes, she's ambitious. It is such an extraordinary time. The words that she quotes her mother saying are ones that really resonated with me. While I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. The sky is the limit for this next generation with her as a role model. Coming up, our other role models offer advice to women, young girls, and anyone who wants to dream big. Dream with ambition, lead with conviction, and see yourselves in a way that others may not, simply because they've never seen it before. Welcome back to I'm Speaking. With the election of the nation's first female vice president, there is hope. Soon women will not have to say, I'm speaking to be heard, and they can go anywhere from the White House to the far reaches of the galaxy. People used to always tell me, can you write something to my son or daughter? to tell them to always do what I tell them to do because, you know, I know you must have done that with your parents and that you were, you know, always studying. Is there some advice that you would give? We learn from all these moments, right? Both when we 
do something really well and when we fall on our face. For me, the craziest story was just not being afraid and trying to make myself afraid. It felt that good. I think that was the surprise for me mm. is that that connection with the world. The view looking down mm -hmm. is really fabulous, right? Looking at the earth and seeing this incredible planet that provides us with all we need. Uh, a shimmering layer of blue light that's our atmosphere. But the other thing, the view looking up is just as powerful. So I always would urge people to go outside and, and look up from time to time. Every road, every rock, every, every mountain you have to climb will be part of the source of strength. Know that who you are at five is not who you're gonna be at 50. Do not be afraid to speak up. Do not be afraid to pursue things. Do not be afraid to venture out into the unknown. In my early, early career, I don't think I was open to that concept. And I often tell people, if I had been open to that concept, perhaps I could be as wealthy as Oprah Winfrey today. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who said to me when I was very young, they said, how old were you when you knew you were a mutant? How old were you when you knew you weren't like other people? And I don't say that in any kind of haughty way, or I don't say it with a lack of humility, but just recognizing I was very different. I was five years old and it took me a while to really get comfortable with like, you just see the world differently. You want something different. Learning to love yourself and be comfortable with yourself is an accomplishment. And I'm proud of that. It's okay to feel different. It's okay to have a unique story. And that the story isn't all pretty because nobody's stories are all pretty. But you still have to celebrate and talk about it and, and be comfortable in your own skin. And listen to the most important voice, which is the quiet one, inside of you. Little girls obviously can uh, achieve greatness. They have achieved greatness and they will continue to achieve greatness. And there's a need to go above and beyond what I've done and what Senator Harris has done. And there's so many other firsts that have to be accomplished. And then New York's Attorney General quotes an inspiring Langston Hughes poem, urging perseverance through the odds. It's called Mother to Son, but these days it certainly applies to our daughters too. Life is difficult and life has not been a crystal stair for me. Langston Hughes goes on to say about the stairs of life, it's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes gone in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Still ahead, women aren't turning back despite the odds, including juggling motherhood. For many women, reaching the top of their career can sometimes feel at odds with their role as a mother. I was full of guilt as a young mother thinking I wasn't spending enough time at work and I wasn't spending enough time with my daughter. And in the beginning, you should have seen me. I was like, I've got it, I've got it. I'm dropping balls all over the place, but saying, oh, no, 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 I, I don't need any help. And when I started asking for help and started sharing with my friends how hard being a single mother was, I found that everybody was struggling. And I thought if I were just smarter or more efficient or better organized or more disciplined or slept fewer hours, maybe it wouldn't be so hard. But no, it's just hard. And it's what really made me to really devote myself to this lifelong passion for gender equity. And that movement is gaining steam. Meanwhile, there's hope. We're teaching our future generations to be proud of who they are, like Melody Hobson and her husband, George Lucas's daughter, Everest. We went through this phase where she would say, you know, I'm beige. And I'd say, no, you're black. And my husband would say, well, she is white too. And I said, yes, she is. But your rules, a drop of black makes you black. That's America. And that's how she will be seen. And I want her to see herself the way people see her. She's black. And I don't say that to in any way um, to, to suggest that she is not half white, but I want her to really own that aspect of herself. And so um, she was doing a project for school. She's in second grade on identity. And she had the, all of these bubbles I, identifying herself, self-described identity. And I actually was really happy because one of the bubbles she put black. 
Being proud of yourself is not just for young girls. It's important to teach young boys as well, like Valerie Jarrett's grandson. We often talk about what this means for our girls, but I want our boys to feel the same way. And hopefully these future leaders won't have to say, I'm speaking to be heard, because what they have to say matters. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lori Stokes and I'm speaking.